Amen. So let's clap our hands to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and bless his name this morning. Glory to God. Glory to God. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. Just before you take your seat, let me say a few things. Uh, first of all, I sure do love Pastor Larry Huggins and his beautiful wife. What an incredible asset they are to Jubilee and uh, give an honor where honor is due. I, I love my pastor, Pastor Dick Burnell, and he mentioned something about me coming out here or something, and praise God, amen. I, whatever, whatever he wants, I'm in it. But I do know this much, that God is merging giftings and anointings. He's, a ner he, he's merging uh, ministries across this nation, and the power of merging is this, that two are better than one. Amen. If one can put a thousand of flight, two can put ten thousand of flight, then what can we all do if we come together in a confluence of what God has purposed in the earth? Amen. So I'm excited about that. I'm also extremely excited to be able to preach for Pastor Larry tonight at the summit. I invite all of you out. It's going to be a powerful move of God. If you do not mind, I'm going to get right into what I feel like God is doing and saying in this moment, amen, because this moment is very powerful for you. So I'm asking you to lift your hands, please, all over the building. Father, I thank you for a conspicuous anointing that is in this building to break every generational curse and dismiss every generational spirit. I thank you, Lord, for the power of truth, and I thank you for the arrival of truth. And we realize, God, that when we get to truth, truth makes us free. And I thank you for re freedom and liberty all over this sanctuary today. And we say, have your way in each of our lives in Jesus' name. Now, let's clap our hands one more time to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before you sit down, high five three people and tell them it's on in the building. It's on in the building. Amen. Amen. Since I was here last, uh, I think the last time I was here was at Thunder, and the Lord gave me the wonderful opportunity to speak the Sunday before Thunder and then the Sunday after Thunder. And then when I left here, I went on just a preaching um, circuit and I've been home, actually, in San Antonio only, I think, four or five days since you saw me last. And so I've been preaching night after night, city after city, plane after plane, pulpit after pulpit. And it's been an extraordinary experience. But one thing that I've noticed is I have just stepped into the cities that God has uh, assigned me to visit over this little tenure is that there is an expectation of revival that is sweeping this nation right now. There's something turning in the hearts of God's people. You can feel it. And where there is expectation, there is guaranteed breakthrough. See, anticipation is the precursor of the announcements of your prophetic destiny. So what you anticipate is what you will hear announced. So it's very important that we point our expectation towards God's will for our lives. So as I was praying for you this morning, the one thing I prayed for uh, deliberately, and even I'll even say desperately, is that God would increase the expectation of the hearts of every person that stepped in this building. Because as someone once said, expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. So where there's expectation, there are guaranteed miracles. The Bible says of the man that was sitting at the gate called Beautiful, that he looked at the apostolic anointing or the apostles that were walking by, and the Bible says he expected to receive something from them. Now, I promise you, if you came in here expecting, God will exceed your highest expectation. Now, look at your neighbor and tell him, give God something to work with. Amen. So, expect God to do something prolific. Expect him to do something prophetic. Expect him to do something profound. And I guarantee you that he will supersede your expectations. Can you say amen to that? God is good, isn't he? Do you love the Lord with all of your heart? Are you glad you're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you glad you have purpose, power, and potential? 
Are you excited about being in the house of God? Are you expecting God to do something great in your life? Then jump on your feet one more time and praise him like you know something great is going to happen in your life today. Come on, y'all. I know you, Jubilee. Let's praise him like we know something is about to break out. Something is about to break forth. There's going to be a personal breakthrough in your life today. God is up to something big, and you are in the middle of it. Come on, y'all. Don't stop praising him. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. As you remain standing, remain standing. Genesis chapter 32, verse number 24. I'll read our text and get right in it. And you know what? I want prophetic movement in this building today. I feel it's strong. I just, I, I desire that very, uh, very desperately again, that God do something very strong in this building. And I've learned this, that where there is participation and not spectatorship, God will move by his spirit. Amen. So if you're not saying amen, you're praying in your spirit. Amen. Genesis chapter 32, verse number 24. And he rose up that night and took two of his wives and his two women's servants and his 11 sons. And he passed over the fort of Jabot. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over all that he had. And Jacob underlined these words. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go, Jacob speaking, I will not let you go except thou bless me or until you bless me. And he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Powerful. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray, your name. And he said, wherefore is it that you do ask my name? And he blessed him there. Underline those words. And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life, boy, this is strong, my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. I'm going to preach a message this morning that is entitled, The Blessing That Changed My Walk. I want you to say those words to about four people around you, the blessing that changed my walk. Now, let me pray one more time before you sit down. Father, I thank you for an open heaven over this sanctuary. I thank you for easy preaching. I thank you that people will hear what is not said. I thank you, God, that the power of your word will show up in this building strong today. Jeremiah said, your word is like a hammer that breaks to pieces the heart of stone. Hebrews tells us your word is like a sword. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So, Father, we pray your word does its work today. And we give you praise now in Jesus' name. One last time, praise him with all your heart. Praise him with all your heart. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. I know we are participating, so one last time, high five three people and tell them God is about to touch you in this building today. The blessing that changed my walk. When I left here the last time, you may be seated after the last service at Thunder, the Lord began to deal with me on the power of blessing, Pastor Larry. And he, you alluded to it today, so I knew that was a confirmation from the Spirit of God that I was on page with God. And the Lord has not left me alone, no, not day or night, about speaking a blessing, being a blessing, seeing a blessing. And I began to study the nature of God's blessing. 
I began to study, uh, study the conditions of God's blessing and then the lasting effect of God's blessing when it gets on a person's life. How that when God blesses you, it does not matter what transpires in the process or progress of life. The blessing of God cannot be altered. As a matter of fact, we are really returning to the original attention, intention of God. Because Genesis 1.28, the first thing God ever did for his creation is bless it. So the original intention of God was what? Blessing. And his original intention is his final decision. So no matter what has transpired in your life, if you receive the birthright of being a child of God, then you have to walk in the blessing of God. Now, everybody does not gravitate towards your blessing. Everybody does not celebrate your blessing. Everybody's not going to endorse your blessing. And I just came by Jubilee to tell you, don't worry about everybody. Because if you blessed, you are blessed, and can't nobody change the fact that you are blessed. Somebody shout it right now, I am blessed. So we find Jacob, the final uh, patriarch in this triune of patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you know, Jacob is that third part of that trinity that comes along with a little few uh, bent issues in his life. Now, I know none of us in this building have anything that we have to deal with. You know, that we are all so, so safe, sanctified, and filled with the Spirit of God. We're actually angels, and we have wings hanging over the back of our chairs. I'm being uh, facetious right now, but to understand that Jacob is this guy that has this little bend in him, uh, that causes him to get into situations that seem like they have the power to alter God's hand in his life. So the Bible says he gets in a situation uh, where he is running from Laban. He's running toward Esau. He's trying to reconcile what he initially segregated. And on the run between Laban and Esau, the Bible says he is left alone in verse number 24. And I just want to pause right there, and I just want to concentrate on that thought of being alone. And I want to submit this to you, that there is a difference in being lonely and being alone. I can't tell you the number of times I've been in ministry 35 years that the Lord has told me, get by yourself. Because when you get by yourself, you cut off all influences, you cut off all voices, you cut off everything else but the voice of God. That's when you set your iPhone down, turn Facebook off, turn the TV off, turn everything off, and you are left alone with God. And the most powerful revelations I've ever received from God is not when I was with a bunch of people, but it was when I was all by myself. And the Bible says Jacob was left alone. And then watch this. When he realizes what God is doing, he sends everything he has out in front of him. And he stays on the other side of the brook. There is a blessing that comes only through solitude. Talk, Bishop, in this building. There is a blessing that comes only through solitude. We go through too many decision-making uh, calisthenics when we are with people all the time telling us what we ought to be doing. Hmm. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. My God today. But when you get by yourself and you say, God, galvanize my conviction, solidify me in the solitude that I'm enjoying right now with you. And how many of you know that when you are alone with God, it is precious because you can experience him in ways that you cannot experience him when you're with a bunch of people. 
And Jacob is left alone with God. And I began to study men in Scripture who was left alone with God, and God did profound things. Abraham is left alone, and when he is by himself, he hears God say, leave your country and leave your kind and go to a land that I will show you. Insinuating the idea you cannot really enjoy seeing into your or peering into your prophetic future as long as there are so many pronouncements around you from the participants in your life that do not qualify to be there. Sometimes you got to leave your kind and you got to leave your country to really hear where God is calling you to be. It comes by progressive revelation. I'm sorry. I'm in a hurry. I'm going to preach this thing quick. But every devil in San Jose is going to leave this region and every demon that has been haunting and taunting you is going to leave your life. You're going to walk out of here today with your shoulders square, held head held high, knowing who you are in God. You know what? I'm going to stop right now and I'm going to prophesy to you and tell you that you are blessed, 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 blessed. If you believe you are blessed, clap your hands and shout to God one more time. Bless your name, Jesus. Moses hears from God when he's left alone, and he hears from him out of a burning bush. Joshua does not see the captain of the Lord's host until he's by himself. Elijah hears a still, small voice when he is alone with God. David chooses five smooth stones when he is alone with God. Jesus prays, Father, if it be your will, when he is by himself, Psalm 102, verse 7, David wrote these words, I watch and I am, I am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. I'm looking, God, but I feel like I'm all by myself, but I am on the roof. I'm not on the ground. I might be by myself, but I'm, I'm at the peak of my destiny when I'm all alone. And I'm going to go ahead and submit this to you. When people walk out of your life that God has not assigned to your life, quit trying to hold on to what God has already told to leave. Quit mourning over what God removed from your life. And many times God will remove people from your life in order for you to receive the blessing of God that is coming from other people trying to get in your life. Bishop, help yourself. In solitude, David said, watch this, he's hiding from Saul, Pastor Larry. He's anointed and he's in a cave and Saul's trying to kill him. And he writes these words, I cried to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I made my supplication all by himself. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. In the way, in the way wherein I walked, they have probably laid a snare for me. Watch what he said all by himself. I looked on my right hand and there was no man. That would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul all by myself. But right there, I cried to the Lord, and I said, you are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry. I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I am. Watch what he says. Bring my soul out of this prison, and I will praise your name. The righteous shall come past me about, for you shall deal bountifully with me. Here's the promise you make in solitude. Lord, when I come out of this season, when I come out of this phase, when I come out of this term, when I come out of this duration, I'm going to praise you like I have never praised you before. Anytime God brings you into a season of solitude, it is a setup for what's on the other side of you being by yourself. And many people in this building are going through a season in your life where it seemed like God is removing people. Just, he's just cutting stuff off and he's just getting it down to you and him. 
I promise you, when that happens, get ready, get ready, get ready, because your solitude is a preparation for what God is about to bring in your life. Somebody shout hallelujah right there. So in solitude, in solitude, watch what he does. Jacob prays, let me go. The, the, the angel prays, let me go for the day breaks. And watch what Jacob prays. I will not let you go except you bless me. Whew. And the angel said, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And the angel said, your name shall no more be called Jacob. Man, I'm trying to contain myself, y'all. But now your name going to be Israel. For as a prince, you have power with God and men, and you have prevailed. And Jacob said, tell me, I pray, what's your name? I like that. He said, don't ask me my name. I'm just here to bless you. Now watch this. He's left alone and God pounces on him. And he does it for one reason, for Jacob to face himself. The angel said, what is your name? Quit denying who you are. Quit denying the patterns that have engraved themselves into your personality. Now your reputation is preceding you. He said, until you face who you are, you can never see who I'm making you. He said, I admit it, Pastor Randy. My name is Jacob. Then God said, now I can work with that. Because now you being honest. Too many people refuse to face, not God, to face themselves. Sometimes we have to look in the mirror and say certain things are not happening in my life because certain things are going on in my life. And until you can face the music, don't expect to dance. And Jacob said, my name is is Jacob. The only reason he asked him, listen, it's not only that he would face himself, but he could realize who he's becoming. Because when he said, I'm Jacob, then God said, yes, you are Jacob. But this is who you are becoming. Anytime God deals with you about where you are presently, he's only doing it to introduce you to who you are becoming in your future. So when God says stop and look at yourself, it's only for you to realize that God is only showing you faults that you cannot bring into your future. Let me say it like this. You can't talk yourself out of a problem you behaved yourself into. You got to face Yourself, I'll say it again, you cannot talk yourself out of a problem that you have behaved yourself into. And Jacob had a behavior problem because the problem had become a pattern. His name means to circumvent, not just to deceive or supplant, but literally to circumvent. Circumventing is taking shortcuts. So many people want to take a shortcut to the blessing of God. So many people think you can circumvent doctrine and enjoy destiny. Talk in this building, Bishop. So many people think you can circumvent instruction and then receive direction. You can't get around instruction and then get direction. You have to adhere to God's instruction for you to be able to receive his direction. Many people don't know where they're going because they will not recognize who they are. Go on and preach, Bishop. I, I know it's early, but I'm smelling fried chicken already. Amen. you saying something in this building, Bishop. So everybody's saying, Lord, show me where to go. Show me what to do. And the Lord's saying, listen to my instructions. 
David said before he said, take me anywhere, he said, search me, O God, and see if there's anything in me that is prohibiting your promise from being released in my life. I'm sorry, y'all, I know it's early, but I'm about to lift my voice now and feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that God wants you to enjoy your very best life. And the enemy's trying to trick you. He's trying to detour you. He's trying to distract you. But today, the enemy's voice is going to be silenced. God's power is going to be released. You're going to be launched. Somebody clap your hands and praise him right there. Thank you, Jesus. Your name is Jacob, but your name shall be Israel from now on. You will be referred to as a prince with God because you have prevailed with God and with man, your manhood. The man he defeated was himself. Woo! Self-control, I don't care what nobody says, self-control is the toughest fruit of the Spirit. And the Bible says a man without self-control is like a city whose walls are broken down. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm staying on this point. I was not premeditated, but somebody needing this. What I'm going to just drop on you one more time is you need to handle your business. Amen. You need to look at yourself and say, God, whatever is slowing me down from becoming everything you ordained me to be, whatever is slowing me down from walking in the blessing that you preordained for me to enjoy, I ask you to remove it from my life. I don't care how bad it hurts. I don't care if you have to tear it, take it, whatever it takes, get it out of my life because I know your hand is on me and I want to please you and I want to live in my purpose in the earth and fulfill your will in the earth for my life. So do whatever you have to do. Throw your hands up and shout it, Lord, do whatever you have to do. Come on, say it again, Lord, do whatever you have to do. Now watch what happens here. He said, let me go. The angel says it, for the day breaks. Now watch what Jacob says. I will not let you go except you bless me. Now if anybody knew the art of holding on, Jacob did. When he was born, what was he doing? Holding on to his brother's heel. He was a heel catcher. And when he caught something, he knew how to hold on to it until his change come. Job prayed like this, all the days of my appointed time, I will wait I will hold on until my change come. You know what I've noticed? Too many people allow God to get a hold of them, but they don't get a hold of him. It's one thing for God to touch you in an altar. It's another thing for you to grab hold of him and walk out the church with him. It's high time for us to stop having altar experiences and start enjoying altar experiences where we grab hold to God and say, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. In other words, I didn't come in here for you to touch me like that just to have an emotional experience, just to feel your presence in a temporary moment. No, God, if you're going to dare touch me like that, then I promise you I'm going to hold on to you. Come hell or high water, I'm going to hold on to you. When everybody else walks out, I'm going to hold on to you. When my family rejects me, I'm going to hold on to you. When I lose my best friend, I'm going to hold on to you. When all my company leaves my life, I'm going to hold on to you. And I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. The woman with the issue of blood said, If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made Ho! The word literally means if I can grab hold of his garment, if I can attach myself to his virtue, I will never be the same. My God, if you've gone through all the hell you've gone through to get in his presence, please don't leave the same person you came in at. 
If there's anybody in this building that says I'm going to hold on until he bless me, I double dog dare you jump on your feet and say, God, I'm not letting you go. Throw your head back and open your mouth and say, God, I'm not letting you go. Say it again. I'm not letting you go. Y'all going to let me preach this whole word? How much time I have left, Pastor? About an hour? Okay. Sit down for one second. I'm about done. L listen to Bishop just for a moment. Listen, folks. Grab hold of God today. You say, Bishop, that sure sound country to me. Grab hold of God. <laughs> I think you understand that vernacular. Grab hold of God. It's the paradox of our soul. It's the paradox of our soul. David said, my soul panteth hard after thee, O God. The next sentence says, your hand upholds me. That's paradox. How can you be after God and God be holding you at the same time? It's the paradox of Christianity. It's the peril of the believer. God wants you ever after him knowing he's got you at all times. I'm looking for people, and I believe God is searching this nation for a congregation of people that will say, with reckless abandonment, I am going after God. With all, I didn't hear, I'm not here for a song, I'm not here for a preacher, I'm not here for a personality. I am here to grab hold of the presence of God and grab hold of it until my life is changed. Somebody shout, I'm not letting go until you bless me. I got, I got it just for a minute. Until you bless me. Now here's what it means in Hebrew, and I'm almost done. Until you consecrate me with favor. You can never show me a blessed person that's not a favored person, Tamara. If you bless, you're favored, which means to consecrate you. Sanctification is pulling apart. Consecration is filling your hands. Whew. Can I tell you that God wants to bless you to the point that your hands are so full of favor that whatever your hands find to do prospers? You are blessed when you are consecrated with favor till favor is all over you. You walk into an employment place to get a job. You can't even fill out the application, and the boss is looking at you saying, I need to hire you right now. A favored person is easily recognizable according to Isaiah 61. The Bible says, and they will recognize that you are blessed. The blessing of God is for the purpose of distinction. Now, I'm pronounced over you. You are not a cursed individual. You are a blessed person. And you must consecrate your life with favor. Blessing is consecrating your life with favor. So what do you do, Pastor Rick? Wake up every morning, take your hands, and just do this here and say, I feel my hands with favor. Everyone I shake hands with, going to feel my favor. Everywhere I go, they going to see my favor. I walk into the grocery store, I'm walking with favor. I expect any moment for somebody to put a blessing on me because I have so much favor on my life. Why is that so important? Because the blessing of favor will get you in places finances will never get you. Tweet that, please. The blessing of favor will get you in places that finances could never get you. The blessing of favor will bring things into your life you cannot buy with money. That's why Malachi said, if you will bring the tithe and offering, he said, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out what? Say it again blessing that there's not room enough to receive. He didn't say I'd pour you out money. Blessing is more valuable than money. 
I'll pour you out favor. There's not room enough to receive it. I'm telling y'all, I am so on this message. It's so in me since I left here at Thunder that I am blessing everybody I see. I'm at my line the other day in Chicago trying to get a flight. And it looked like I'm going to miss my flight. And I walked up to the flight attendant that is at the counter and I said, ma'am, before I ask you for anything, I just need to say this to you. May God consistently do good in your life. She looked up at me. She adjusted her head. And she said, and may God bless you. I said, now, ma'am, I don't know what you're feeling in this particular region right here, but I feel blessing all around us. She said, well, I do too. I said, well, ever since you're feeling such a great blessing, I need to ask you for a favor. She said, what do you need? I said, I need you to do yourself a favor. Bless me. She said, how? I said, I need on that flight. She said, give me your ticket. She said, you must be a preacher. I said, I am a preacher, but I am a speaker of blessing. And let me tell you, when you are covering and carrying blessing and favor in your life, start expecting stuff to happen for you that you don't see for nobody. If you are ready to walk in your blessing, clap your hands one more time and praise him. I'm convinced of this, Pastor Larry. We have a bank of blessing that many of us have not tapped into and is backed up with blessing. Shoo! I believe there's a storage, right? A storage of blessing that God has for us and he's just waiting. It's like it is looking. It's like it is just waiting, anticipating an opportunity to jump all over you. Wait till the next service when I preach that commanded blessing. Because that command, oh, the next service I'm preaching the commanded blessing. That's when God looks at blessing and says, overtake him. And I'm here to tell you God is about to put a blessing on you that nothing can get off of you. Nothing can remove it from your life. God cannot wait to bless you. If you want to be blessed, clap your hands one more time and praise him. shoe came untied and I don't want to deal with it. Amen. I don't feel like dealing with it. Amen. Don't feel like tying it. feel like taking it off. Shout it again. I am blessed. Now before I get done with you by Wednesday night, you're going to know you blessed. You're going to know you blessed to be a blessing. You're going to know that everybody that comes in contact with you is going to be blessed. You, I, I'm so into it that I got home for four or five days not at a time over this last little season. I went out the first day I got home, I walked in, and I have a dog named DJ. He's a cane corso. He weighs 125 pounds. And he's so happy to see me when I get home. It's like I love the way he greets me. If I ever find me a wife that greets me like DJ, I'm probably going to get married. But I walked in, and he jumping and turning and, and, and moaning and trying to lick me. And I just looked at him. I said, sit down, DJ. And old DJ just sat down. I said, DJ, he's looking at me. I said, you are a blessed dog. You know what I started doing? I blessed my swimming pool. I blessed my cars. I walked out to my gate. I said, gate, you are blessed. The cold in you is blessed. My shoes are blessed. My socks are blessed. My clothes are blessed. My kids are blessed. My grandkids are blessed. My great-grandkids, I ain't never seen a blessed. And nothing's going to be blessed in your life until you say it's blessed. Because blessing does not come through thought. Blessing comes by the spoken word. When you speak it, it takes on a history of itself. 
When you speak blessing, it takes on a personality of itself. Blessing is so strong, Harry, that once you bless, you can't take it back. Once God blesses it, he does not take it back. That's why the gifting and calling of God is irrevocable. Because the gifting and calling of God is a blessing. He can't take it back. When Isaac blesses Jacob instead of Esau, what did he say? I feel Esau, but I hear Jacob. Meaning Jacob was saying something. Until you say something, you're not going to get blessed. That's why I can't think blessing on you, Pastor Larry. I can't sit here and premeditate and transcend all thought. And You can't think blessing. All blessing that is activated in the Bible is spoken by someone's mouth. And the Bible says in our story that the angels stopped wrestling and started blessing. And the Bible says he blessed him when he touched his strongest part. And it means stubborn part, the most powerful part of a man. Whew. Be honest. How many of you would say there's some stubbornness in me somewhere? There about 15 of us right in this area here. There's some stubbornness in us. Whew. And God, once he touched him, watch this, he blessed him. Boy, I wish I had time. What time is it, y'all? 1030? What time the next service start? 11 feet, I had to stop, but I don't want to. Because I'm here to tell you when God blesses you like I'm talking about, you will never walk the same again in your life. The Bible says from that day forward, he halted on his thigh, which means the pace of his walk changed after God blessed him. Can I encourage you in something today? God is about to change the cadence of your calls in the earth. He's about to change the pace of your purpose in the earth because he's about to put a blessing on you. When he halted in his thigh, it literally means the style of walking changed. Listen, some of you have walked through life with your head held down, depressed, shoulders slumped over. You won't believe where I came from, Bishop. You don't believe what I've been through. Honey, let me tell you something. When God blesses you, your back's going to straighten up. Your head going to come up. He is the glory and the lifter of your head. Your walk is about to change. Where you've been dragging your feet, you're about to start running with vision. If anybody in here is ready for God to put a blessing on your life, jump on your feet and begin to praise him like you've already received it. That's pretty good, but I want you to throw your head back. Clap your hands. Shout to God. <laughs> Why, Bishop, are you so adamant about us walking in the blessing of God? First of all, the theological doctrine of blessing has been lost in the body of Christ over the last two decades. And Pastor Larry will understand that language better than anyone in this building because we used to practice our proclamation. We used to see what we believed God was giving us and we would claim it. We've lost all of that. Now we're just trying to endure life, survive life. God didn't save you to survive life. God did not save you to endure life. God saved you to enjoy life and enjoy life abundantly. I am after this blessing so strong for this reason. Too many people have rehearsed the curse for too long. And we're scared of the curse when God himself said, a curse can only go to your grandson. That's as far as a curse can go in your lineage. That's a principle of scripture. That is theologically correct. That the father's father's curse is on you. 
but we don't read the rest of the Bible. Because the blessing of God lasts a thousand generations. That's why when I look behind me at all my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren, they are all blessed because Papa said the curse stops right here. No more. I reverse the curse and I release blessing over all my family. Come on, y'all. I believe something is shifting right now. Hallelujah. Isaac, I'm going to ask you to move this stuff here, and I'm going to do something real quick. We've got to do this in five minutes. So if this is your word, come to this altar right now. You say, Bishop, this is my word. Come on right now. You say, this is my word. I needed this. Come right now, quick as you can. We've got to do this quick. Amen. I've got to do this quick. Come on. You say, Bishop, this is my word. I want to walk in the blessing. I want the blessing on my life, my kids' life. I want it on my grandchildren's life. I want it in my yard. I want it in my house. I want it on my finances. I want it on my health. I want everything about me blessed. I want everything around me blessed. Everything attached to me is blessed. Everything connected to me is blessed. Everything I'm involved in is blessed. Everything I think about is blessed. Throw your hands up and say, Lord, I receive your blessing. Hallelujah. Now, with your hands up, your hands are toward him. Put your eyes on me just for a moment. I always pray before I preach, Lord, I break every generational curse. Y'all have heard me pray that, right? Every time I break every generational curse. For the first time this morning, Eileen, the Lord spoke to me and said, you can't break a curse without releasing a blessing. In other words, when the curse is broken, the blessing is released. So the Lord told me to start praying like this. I break every generational curse and I release a blessing to a thousand generations. Hallelujah. Every hand raised as high as you can get it. Father, reverse the curse in my life. It stops with me. And now, Lord, release the blessing on my life and a thousand generations behind me. I receive your blessing. I receive your word. I thank you now that I am a walking blessing. I'm a talking blessing. My life will never be the same in the name of Jesus. Lord, I repent for anything that is prohibited your blessing from flowing in my life and the life of my family. And now, Lord, I permit blessing to flow through my life in Jesus' name. Now look, y'all. Look at Bishop. Don't walk out of here. Don't walk. I'm, in this next service, I'm going to preach this commanded blessing. It's going to change your life. But now listen, don't walk out of here behaving like you did not just pray that prayer. All right? You have to change your behavior. Talk blessed. I was with Ryan. I was with Josh the other day. You know, Josh, and, and we're going down the road, and I got a call. Can I just be vulnerable with y'all? And, and listen, we're going to receive an offering in a minute. So before y'all leave, bring that offering up here. Amen. I'm just doing what Pastor Dick suggested. We're going down the road. I got a call from my assistant. I've been on the road for 30-something days. I'm tired. I'm tired of hotels. I'm tired of planes. And I was a little irritable. And it was my assistant. And she said, you're going to kill me. As soon as she said it, I said, what did you do? And I have a beautiful SRT8 uh, charger. It's not really expensive, but I like it. And she said, I wrecked your car. Do 
y'all know what filled my mouth? Anger. I wanted to open my mouth and say, y'all know what I wanted to say. And the Lord checked me. And the Lord said, speak a blessing over her. I said, Angelique, are you okay? She said, I'm good, Bishop. I said, you're blessed. I said, the car is blessed. Is the person you hit okay? She said, they're okay. I said, they're blessed too. I said, I just speak blessing over this whole situation. Cars can be replaced. They can be fixed. I said, so you know what? Let's thank God right now for the blessing. And we started thanking God for the blessing. What could have happened that didn't happen? All it takes is changing what you say and how you say it. So the next time you feel yourself about to get angry, just switch it up. And say, instead of condescending, begin promoting. And say, I just bless you in Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that? How strong, how strong could a church be if we all just bless one another all the time? How strong could a family be if we just blessed each other all the time? How strong would your kids be if every morning before they got on the bus, you sat down eating that oatmeal and them raisins in it, and you looked at them and you said, baby, you blessed in the city, you blessed in the field, you blessed on that bus, you blessed at that school, you blessed in your future, you blessed in this house. Those words are creative. They're formative. In the same way with cursing, they destroy. Choose to bless. And like Pastor Dick says, choose to bless and not blast. Amen. I love you guys so much. And here's what I want you to do before you leave. Give me a minute to get my shoes on. And I'm going to double knot them this next time. But then I want you to, as I'm putting my shoes on, I want you to go get a blessing. Listen, Pastor Larry, I want you to tell Pastor Dick this. This is not, this blessing right here is not for me. This is for this house. And I want y'all to bless this house. Can you do that? If you bless it, God will put a blessing on you. Amen. Run and get that and come back. Amen. If, if you pray to pray, want to pray a prayer of salvation, we'll be in the foyer to pray with you. If you need it in the altar, we'll be here. If you've never been born again. But I want to shake your hand and get to meet you, and I'll be in the foyer immediately after service when we dismiss. As a matter of fact, Pastor Larry, why don't you come on and direct the people? Amen. Pastor Larry.